Ninjas, warriors of the shadows, the masters of stealth. They're as commonly associated with the great empire of Japan as samurai, cherry blossoms, and freakishly good baseball players. And since they're so popular, ninjas have had a tremendous amount of portrayals in Japanese media, including movies, manga, TV shows, and of course, video games. And back during the 80s and 90s, we gamers got many awesome ninja characters from Japan, like Ryu Hayabusa from Ninja Gaiden, Jo Musashi from Shinobi, Goemon from Ganbare Goemon, Jajamaru from Ninja Jajamaru, Princess Kurumi from Ninja Princess, Hiryu from Strider, and of course, Kage from The Legend of Kage, an arcade game originally developed by Taito and released in 1984 and eventually ported across various consoles and computers, with possibly the best and most recognized version being released on the Nintendo Famicom in Japan on April 18th, 1986, and eventually the NES in North America in August of 1987. And as far as I know, it didn't come to Europe. Sorry, guys. With all that said, let's review this bitch! You may remember an old video I uploaded in August 2017 called Help! My Famicom's Audio is Broken, where I showed that my Famicom was making the static buzzing noise and drowning out the audio, possibly due to radio interference, since I could hear music and bumpers from local radio stations. I started having this problem long before I made the video, and I've tried vigorously since then to repair it, frantically searching the internet for answers, but to no avail. Luckily, I've recently picked up an AV Famicom to replace the old one, because the picture and sound quality are a step up from the old one, I don't have to use channel 95 or 96 in order to see the picture, and I can even use it with my EasyCab to record game footage with greater ease. It even came with a free copy of Super Mario Bros., which is pretty cool. Anyway, I do have the original Famicom cartridge for this review, so no Wii emulators today. One more thing I must mention is that there are some differences between the Famicom and NES versions of The Legend of Kage, and I will be taking a look exclusively at the Famicom version since it's the version that I own. Luckily, the differences aren't big enough to make the Famicom and NES versions their own separate entities, so you don't have to worry about your experience being different from mine if you choose to pick up the NES version. Now, without further ado, Let's review The Legend of Kage for the Nintendo Famicom. Of course, I can't refer to the Famicom version's instruction manual since I can't find it online, and it's in Japanese, which I do have some knowledge of, but not enough of it for me to understand an entire manual. The only way I could understand it is with a translator, but having to translate all of it would take me too much time. So, for this review, I will be using the NES version's instruction manual as a reference since it's in English. And according to the manual, this game takes place toward the end of Japan's Edo period, where Princess Kiri is kidnapped by evil ninjas attacking the country, and Kage is the only one who can secure her safety. Standard stuff, really. When the game begins, we see Kiri walking through the forest when she gets kidnapped by a blue ninja, and Kage leaps out of a nearby tree ready to kick some ass and aid in the princess's rescue. You control Kage as he must find and kill the red yobo preventing him from escaping the forest to the secret passage, which leads to the fortress where Kiri is held captive. The red yobo will only show himself after Kage kills a couple of blue yobos. The yobos are magic monks that can spit fire like King Koopa from Super Mario Brothers. That's pretty... well, how does one say? Toasty! Thank you. Meanwhile, Kage will have to deal with blue ninjas that throw shuriken and red ninjas that throw shuriken and bombs. Once he does kill the red yobo, Kage will escape the forest to the secret passage where he must kill 10 blue yobos before he can advance. After this, he must scale the walls of the fortress while dealing with attacking ninjas until he gets to the top of the wall. And finally, Kage must storm the fortress while every enemy is out for his blood. Once he reaches the top, Kage must cut the princess free with his sword. And once Kiri is free, Kage will grab her and escape onto the roof. They'll take a huge leap of faith and somehow survive the fall and attempt to escape. But unfortunately for them, a blue ninja will swoop in and nab Kiri once again, and Kage will have to fight the Genbo, which are basically a pair of white twin yobos. The trick to beating the Genbo is to kill the butterfly that appears on the screen and then kill the two Genbo. 
After they're defeated, Kage will have to go through the same process again, only this time during autumn. After the princess is nabbed again for the second time, Kage must fight Yukinosuke, a ninja wielding two swords. The trick to beating Yukinosuke is to do the same thing that you did with the Genbo, first killing the butterfly and then attacking Yukinosuke. After defeating him, Kage will go through the same process for a third time now during the winter. Unfortunately, I can only get as far as the beginning of the winter stage before dying, so I can't show you what happens beyond here, but I'll still tell you what happens from what I've heard. When Kiri is captured for the third time, Kage must fight Yoshiro, who is the magician samurai warlord leading the enemy ninjas and yobos. After he's defeated, the game will loop again from the start at a higher difficulty, which was the common standard of the mid-80s. Despite all the trouble that awaits him, Kage has some tools and tricks to help in his mission. He has two weapons at his arsenal, an unlimited amount of shuriken and a sword. The shuriken have a long range but can be blocked by the ninjas when they use their swords. The sword has a short range but can be used to block the shuriken thrown by the ninjas and kill the ninjas who are blocking Kage's shuriken. Kage can also climb trees and has a freakishly huge jump. It's super fun to use, especially when Kage is running through the forest or scaling the fortress walls. Kage will occasionally come across crystal balls that give him amazing powers. The first ball he collects will turn him from red to green and allow him to throw larger shuriken and take an extra hit. If he collects a second ball, he will be turned from green to yellow and now has the ability to run faster. These power-ups are great, but there's a problem with them. When Kage is in his green form and he gets hit, he reverts back to his red form, which seems appropriate. If he gets hit, he loses a power upgrade. However, when he's in his yellow form, rather than reverting to the green form like you'd expect, he goes all the way back to the red form. And when he goes back to his red form, he loses all of his power-ups. And it's even worse because he dies in a single hit. How unfair! Luckily, all the other enemies and bosses die in a single hit, so I guess it's a fair trade. Kage will also come across scrolls that will cause him to stop whatever he's doing, drop to the ground, and start chanting a ninja spell that will conjure up a lightning storm that kills every enemy that enters the screen. It's freaking awesome, and it lasts for about 20 seconds, too. The graphics here are alright. They obviously don't stack up to those of the arcade version which use detailed sprites and backgrounds, but they do do a good job at representing the arcade version and they aren't murder on the eyes. The same can somewhat be said about the music. The songs themselves are good, but the instruments used here are a little bit too plain in my opinion. They're just standard bleeps and bloops that don't complement the game's soundtrack well. The songs originally sounded awesome in the arcade version. Here, they're okay at best and mediocre at worst. <laughs> Lastly, the controls work. They do what they're supposed to and aren't any sort of hindrance. Possibly the best thing about the controls is the jumping mechanics. You can get Kage to jump by pushing up, up left, or up right. And the height of the jump depends on whether you tap or hold down on the control pad. You might think that having the push up to jump is a bad thing, but not for this game, because The Legend of Kage has less of a sense on platforming and more of a sense on action. Hell, the arcade version uses the same control scheme as the Famicom version, so it's not like Taito just ran out of buttons on the controller when they ported this game to the Famicom. So what do I think of The Legend of Kage for the Famicom? It's a nice port of an awesome arcade game and succeeds at what it's trying to do. If you're on the lookout for stellar action games for Nintendo's 8-bit console, you'll definitely want to consider this one. So The Legend of Kage for the Famicom gets an approval from me. Thank you everyone for watching. I'm Andrew Ambrose and I'll catch you later.